Hello and welcome, and I'm delighted to have another amazing guest here, Simone Dukic, who is a managing par partner at One Way Ventures. Hi, Simone. Hello. Uh, so it's a great pleasure because you know we're going to have a fascinating story of how how immigrants invest in immigrants, and uh, we're going to talk a lot about uh, uh, these concepts. But before that, disclaimers, and uh, I promise you that you know this is. Uh, <laughs> This is not going to be the the only great things that we have. Um, so, uh, to this content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. So now we can start. So, Simon, I, I think I, I prefer to always start with the personal story. I know that you have uh, quite an unusual story, quite fascinating. So. Please tell us where are you from, how did you immigrate, and how did how did your immigration story impact your professional trajectory here in the U.S.? So I was born in Moscow. Uh, we left with my parents in 1979, so we were refugees from, from the Soviet Union, I suppose. Uh, landed in, in New Jersey eventually, well, spent some time in Italy, uh, getting visas and so forth, and ended up in the projects in New Jersey. I lived there for about six months until my father was fortunate enough to find a job in the oil industry in Houston, Texas. So I grew up in Houston. So, uh, in, uh, interesting. So, w why uh, why do you like have this? I mean, did you have already this idea to invest only in immigrant-founded uh, startups, or or when did it start? It's like you know, uh, emerge in in your brain. Well, so I spent most of the last 20 years investing in, in early stage tech startups, mostly in the Boston area. I've uh, been in Boston for 30 years now. I've come here for grad school at MIT and, and never left the area. And I uh, invested a lot as an angel. Then I, I ran this accelerator called Techstars in Boston. And uh, when it uh, sort of, I was at the point where I wanted to create some kind of venture brand from scratch as a natural extension of what I was good at. And I wanted to, to do it with some sort of mission that I really believed in. And uh, actually some folks suggested that I do something around immigrants because I think at the time, uh, the thought of immigrants was at the forefront of the political discourse here as Donald Trump was just inaugurated. And one of the first things that happened was a, a ban on visitors from certain Muslim countries, right? And so I found myself kind of upset about it. Um, in fact, actually one of the, uh, one of the founders in the last Texas program I ran was a Canadian young man who was born in Syria, but really like as a baby came to Canada. And so he wasn't able to enter the country at the start of my program in January. You know, I was pissed off. I found myself at the airport, like jumping up and down, holding a side, which, you know, I haven't done since I was a young kid in college or something. And so uh, this, the, it just made me think about that. And, um, but from that point on, I, I thought more about uh, actual outcomes in venture and looked at some of the statistics and realized that, you know what, like the majority of the unicorns, actually have immigrant founders and, and venture returns are driven by these large successes, right? They're not so much driven by, by the small ones. They're driven by like the size of the largest success makes a much bigger difference to your return than like the number of failures, let's say, versus number of small successes. So um, it's really important to, to filter initially on the kind of founders that are more likely to build very big companies. And it turns out that, you know, there's a number of characteristics uh, that founders have that make it more likely statistically, but most of those also cause a higher price at the starting point. Like the valuation of, let's say, a second-time founder who already sold the business is going to be much higher in the very beginning. You're going to skip the early stage rounds, right, go straight to an A or whatever. Whereas immigrant founders is like the only characteristic that both correlates to a higher probability of building something really large and does not command a premium in the early stage valuations. So there was an arbitrage opportunity in that regard. Mm -hmm. That kind of drew my attention initially. And then uh, I found other folks who were excited about it. I thought more and more. I started you know, talking to potential investors, ended up raising a fund quite quickly. Actually, later that same year, in, in 17, we already did a closing and started investing out of one way. And uh, we found that uh, it was just an interesting group to focus on. you got to filter on something, right? You can't, you can't look at everything in the world. And uh, you know, because we invest in the early stages, we want to filter on something having to do with the team rather, rather than the market or, or other things. So the team is the most important criteria anyway that, that you look for right in an early stage investment and so you know that's what we went with and it really resonated it helped us uh, get uh, everyone's attention it helped us get stronger deal flow you know expand we had some venture partners expanded to, to montreal actually then later to the west coast of the u.s 
that looked at you know immigrant founders from all over the world to this region mostly, uh, and um, we found that uh, these founders were excited to work with us. You know, and in addition to whatever value we could have from our personal networks from helping the founders, you know, uh, we also um, you know we also made them feel good, right, about joining this like larger group instead of hanging out maybe with other folks from the same country as them, of whom there might not be that many, right? We help them like expand their identity and think of all the immigrants uh, in their tech startup community, right? A as a single people, almost like a nation, right? And that's, that's an empowering way to think. And they just thought it was neat. It was neat that we were drawing attention to this. And often, often I think we were welcome to come into rounds that otherwise, you know, only a much larger fund would be able to participate in. Uh, it's it's uh, it's really interesting because uh, when I was preparing for the interview, uh, I uh, found the statistics. You know, it's back in 2017, but numbers did not change a lot. That uh, about 43 percent of companies in the uh, to, uh, in the United States, and Fortune 500 companies, were founded or were co-founded by an immigrant uh, or the child of an immigrant. Right. So basically, we're talking about the top companies in the United States and probably in the world. Uh, which almost half of them were like somehow like related to immigrants. So I think there is something special like in the spirit of uh, uh, purely psychological like uh, challenge of being an immigrant and succeeding in proving everyone that you, you're, you know, you're not entitled, you were not born here and you have to prove yourself, right? So I think it's a very smart bet what you're doing and that's why I was excited to, you know, talking to you. Uh, and I want to ask you openly, so do you see a lot of actually other venture funds who are solely focused on immigrants? No. I mean, I think most venture funds realize that immigrants make uh, strong founders and they really like investing in immigrants. But uh, without having that, that core focus, I think it's difficult sometimes mm -hmm. to, to see all the best immigrants that deals, right? Um, they themselves, like most venture partners are, you know, white American men. You know, like, I mean, it's changing slowly, right? But for the most part, uh, there's not as many immigrants in the funds and without that, that sole focus. There is one small fund uh, in, in the West Coast uh, that we, we really like that does focus on very, very early, like pre-seed immigrant startups where there's like maybe a single founder or whatever um, and, and no product. And so we actually wrote a, a small like fund to fund and LP check into their fund just because we are supportive and it's interesting deal flow for us. Uh, called Unshack Adventures. Um, uh, mm -hmm. A couple of young men from India have set that up, and you know I think they're doing quite well too. Uh, but aside from that, there's no other like seed Series A kind of you know substantial VC funds that I know of with this exact focus. And, and there will be, I'm sure there will because it's like a really good way to go, which would be great, right? Hundred percent. I think it's very smart strategy, and and I think it's inclusive and. and I think in the times of COVID, we're going to talk about it later, but in times of COVID, it's becoming even more important because uh, the the world, the workforce is decentralized. You know, like, there's no longer this logic like, oh, let's move to like San Francisco, like, Palo Alto headquarters or like New York or Boston or any other like you know, big hubs in the United States. Like people can just cannot fly anywhere, right? So they're smart. They have great products. They have some traction, right? And like, it's a matter of how do you identify them, right? But we've, before we jump into this um, story, I'm also curious, so you yourself, you know, are, you're a refugee, right? And have you funded any other, you know, like refugee entrepreneurs or SIEs, you know? I don't know. I'd have to go through the list. I'm not sure I recall that they're specifically refugees. There might be some who, who were as kids like me. I mean, I was only 10 years old, right? Um, I, I don't know that we have funded any companies started by you know, people who themselves were refugees personally. Mm -hmm. um, I think I had one in my angel portfolio once, uh, just randomly. Um, but I, I, I don't think we have so many refugees. We, we mostly you know, have folks um, who've come here you know, some time ago, and the teams, a lot of the teams are mixed between uh, immigrant and Native American, <laughs> you know what I mean, uh, Native American founders. Um, but uh, often, you know, often they might have uh, also a, a part of the group in the country that the immigrant came from. Like, often it's typically it's a development organization. Mm -hmm. So, because of course, having that double culture you know, it makes it much easier to to set up a, a lower cost structure offshore uh, without sacrificing, you know, the culture, the teamwork, the feeling that it's it's a single company that sort of you know is normally not recommended to do when you're starting something. You want to have your whole team in one place, right? 
uh, an immigrant can more easily actually have a remote team. Sometimes that's a real part of the group. Um, so I, 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 let, let, let's do the math really quickly. So how many portfolio companies do you have? Uh, I think in fund one, there's around 50 companies now. Okay. So now I'm, I have like over 200 on my lifetime portfolio. Okay. So I'm pretty sure you funded uh, one of the refugees. So I, now I'm, I'm, I'm confident about that. So you don't know it, but I, I think statistically there's a, there's a very high chance. And like that it's you're quite, right. quite possible. The only thing is, you know, sometimes uh, people who really are refugees, like, um, you know, they require a little extra help, right? Especially soon after they come. You know, they, they, they just need a hand. Like we got, you know, my parents got help, right? We lived in public housing and, you know, um, they got some kind of English lessons or whatever, the nonprofits who helped us. Whereas I just want to sort of clarify, you know, so One Way Ventures is not a philanthropic, you know, organization that helps needy immigrants. Like, I mean, we, I have some, a completely parallel thing called the One Way Foundation that I've also created and, and seeded. And that every partner in One Way actually donates some of our carry and the funds, some of our management fees. Uh, to the foundation, but it's a completely separate, you know, charitable thing. And every year we we donate some money to organizations who help refugees, help people who need help. But the immigrants who we invest in, you know, these are typically people who don't need any extra help at all. These are like star founders. These are the very best founders that we could find. And much more often than not, um, they're doing us a favor by letting us invest in their round. Like to, mo most of those 50 investments, you know, are very full rounds that turned away capital from other people. You know, it's, it's fairly unusual for us, you know, to be the only, sometimes we start as the only investor, but then the round fills up, right? And we need it and it's still very full, but more, but the majority of the cases, you know, there were larger funds leading or others leading the rounds and we were just participating in them. Um, so it, yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, like it, it's still like the people will not perceive it as that you're just investing in But the reason why I'm asking you because it's, you know, it's important, like, you know, I give you an example, like, I, I myself, you know, like, you know, fall into this, you know, bracket of like refugees, I say, you say, and, you know, I, I don't consider myself of the needy, like, it was really hard in the beginning when I moved here in, in the States, and, but, uh, you know, there are, like, most of the, most of the people who are, they want to do something, you know, they, they're, like, they're just trying to make it, and then, uh, and, in the United States, there are a lot of opportunities and you can just, you know, you're legal, as long as you're legal uh, alien, so to speak, right? And you are uh, having the rights to work, the rights to open your own business, like, and that's all you need, right? And I'm sure that you're just supporting people who already have the status, so there's no, uh, uh, there's no options for them not to succeed, I would say. Uh, yeah, I don't, that's, that's one thing, you know, I could care less, honestly. We actually, I know we did have one founder in a portfolio who was not here legally. Uh, and I think uh, actually ended up getting kind of grandfathered into the DACA group, right? Uh, wow. Yeah. So, you know. Uh, but again, look, you know, if, if the business is growing right now, do you really think that it is important, the physical location? Like, I would probably the, the, the better question is uh, right now, the COVID era, like in this pandemic, you know, so what is the, 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 the significance of being in a particular location? Well, I mean, just in the last six months, uh, it's become less significant, without a doubt. Location has become less important. Uh, that's a very recent trend, and we'll see how strongly that continues when the pandemic ends. Uh, I think we probably, to some degree, location will become a little less important, but I don't think we're quite at the point where it doesn't matter at all. And certainly, a year ago, yeah, location was critically important. Like it was much easier to build a big company in, in San Francisco than in like pretty much any other city in the world, right? But do you foresee that like, uh, imagine again, like we're, we don't have a crystal ball, right? To predict the future, but we we may assume, right? If, if this, you know, if this like trend will continue, like, and we're gonna see like another half a year of lockdown, like the majority of the countries with a limited travel, uh, et cetera. So, do you really think that there are a possibility that the strong companies with decentralized teams all over the world, you know, they will also have an opportunity to do, let's say, an IPO being not in the United States? Well, they already have that opportunity. I mean, I don't think you need to be in the United States to do an IPO. That's certainly not the case. You can be listed on the NASDAQ and be based anywhere. Uh, or you could go public on a different exchange as well. Um, and there are plenty of examples. I mean, of course, in China, there are lots of very successful unicorn companies, but in, in other parts of the world as well, there are some in Europe, right? The, the, there's one large success in, in Romania, uh, UiPath, right? Um, 
So uh, without a doubt, there are other places to build businesses. It's just that the, the ecosystem in, in the Bay Area is particularly deep, right? There's a lot of resources, a lot of people who have had the experience of working in Google and Facebook and Apple and all these companies, right? Who is still concentrated there to some extent, but it's obviously it's not the only place. I mean, I've actually done most of my investing in the Boston area, and it's, it's great too, right? And I've done a little bit in Europe, you know, uh, the, and so the world will, will continue to have more and more opportunity elsewhere. But for the time being, you know, we are concentrating on the places that have the strongest tech ecosystems because we're looking to invest in the places where there'll be more, more unicorn outcomes. So uh, very quickly we expanded from Boston to the Bay Area and, and you know, we're in Montreal and Toronto because there's a lot of great immigrants there as well. But we absolutely, as we, as we scale this thing, as we grow, we, you know, we're going to certainly open an office in Tel Aviv and, and focus on all the immigrants to Israel from other places, right? Maybe Berlin, uh, maybe eventually the Far East as well, maybe Africa, who knows, right? I mean, it's going to take time. Um, but uh, we don't think about immigration to the United States as a core mission of the fund. It's just that's what we're doing now because that's where we are, um, mm -hmm. the U.S. and Canada, right? Um, but uh, the fund is really going to back the best founders who have immigrated somewhere, from somewhere to somewhere, who have gone through the experience, who've sort of had the, the shift in culture, had a difficult path, had a chip on their shoulder, right, and have been self-selected by reaching enough success despite going through that, despite not having a strong network where they landed, to actually, you know, still have an exciting business. We really mm -hmm. have more predictive of future success. Right. So, so let's talk about like what are the conditions to become uh, a partner, so to speak, like with uh, uh, one way ventures. And so, uh, is it like what what are your typical, you know, like uh, sizes of the checks, and, and like what what are the conditions to actually be onboarded, especially now? Are you talking about limited partners or, or are you talking about founders we invest in? And well, sure. well, let's talk about both. Like, so, so first, obviously more that's for entrepreneurs. Like I think it's more like founders, like that's more uh, interesting on their side. And the other part we can talk about like limited well, so, so, you know, like, like most VCs, we have no interest in talking to most founders, right? We want to only talk to the best people, right? Like to the extraordinary people who are going to achieve amazing rare things. Like that's what we're looking for. So, you know, we have deal flow coming through various, uh, inbound you know channels mostly actually our limited partners bring in actually a lot of our investors bring a lot of referrals and you know my uh, angel portfolio my previous association of tech stars you know we see a lot of stuff from there we mm -hmm. see stuff, you know, from the academic sort of world around especially like where i am in boston around Harvard and mit um uh, you know my partner in, in the west coast sees a lot of deals all from the so former soviet union to to the bay area and so forth and so forth, right? The other VCs send us a lot of stuff that we share deals with. And then we, we select, right? We select based on the strongest uh, CEO, typically. That's like the most important thing, you know, someone who can, who can convince amazing co-founders to join them, to follow them, to want to work for them instead of starting their own company. Someone who's achieved something great already, maybe not another startup, but like something really impressive. And then we look for a dependable technology, right? Like it, it is a tech fund. I mean, it's... You know, we're not going to invest in something that's easy to replicate, easy to copy. It has to either be very unique tech uh, that's differentiated or the business itself has to be defensible in some other way. There has to be like a real first mover advantage that, that if someone, you know, once a company reaches a few tens of millions in revenues, it can't just be copied by someone with much deeper pockets, right? It has a chance to grow into something very large. So, you know, we look at all these things and we make our investment decisions. And uh, in our fund, one is a 500K check size. And we typically invest at the seed rounds. We did a little pre-seed, but usually it was like the institutional seed, which is like a two or $3 million round most of the time. And so we would invest with others, right? We would occasionally lead those larger rounds with, even with a 500K check. Um, and odd, other times we would come in uh, you know, with other investors. Um, now we're, we're going to soon start investing out of a second fund, and that's going to be million-dollar checks to start. Mm -hmm. so a little bit bigger, but the same idea, same, same round generally. And we also do invest in a lot of Series A's where we never lead because those are typically like eight or ten million dollar rounds and it was the same 500k in fund one will be the same one million in fund two in a series a when we have the access because the immigrant founder wants to include us and the other vcs don't they don't try as hard to push us out as they would normally try to push a small fund out they sort of we, we come in almost as if we were an angel even though we're actually a fund it's kind of cool oh it is 
So I'm going to ask you a uh, like more provocative question because uh, I think like you know, that's what people need also like some some more uh, you know deeper dive into uh, how the venture funds actually operate, how they think, right? So once you enter, imagine you identified great unicorn potential, like you know startup, and you write a check, half a million dollar, right? So what is the minimum? Is there first of all, is there a minimum like you know I would say equity stake that you can take in the company? No, absolutely not. We think that's foolish. That's what most funds do. They have like a very, very specific percentage that they mm -hmm. take. You know, their model says they have to have 10% or 15% or whatever, and they follow on it every round to maintain that. We don't do any of that stuff. I don't believe in that. Okay. So how do you operate then? Tell us, like, you know, what, what, how are you doing? That's the very, very, very best founders in the world who most of, you know, who are the, <laughs> the immigrants among them. You know, and the majority of the best ones are, in fact, immigrants, and those are the ones we invest in. And sometimes we pay a high price, and we get a small percentage of the company, and it gets diluted quite often in the later rounds. And we still believe they're fantastic investments, and we know that our results are going to be much better than, than other seed funds that other people start. Like we have, at this point, we have enough evidence to see that, like, the thesis worked, right? Like, the first fund is already almost doubled, you know, in value. And it's not even, we're just finishing up the investment period. It's a 10-year fund, right? We're only three years into it. Um, and so, you know, um, it, it's, it doesn't really matter. Like, uh, when we occasionally come in, you know, in, in, into a, either into a much stronger team or at a higher price or a little bit later stage and therefore more, you know, tracks at a higher price, um, we, we have the same exact expectations about like, you know, a possibility of making like a couple of hundred times our investment, a, a higher possibility of making, you know, 50 times our investment. Like we have a, a sort of probability distribution in mind of the model and it doesn't matter what the entry price is, right? We still have this, you know, if you're paying 20 million uh, at an early stage because it's a really strong team and a really gigantic market, right? The, the chance of, you know, selling that company for, for 20 billion is the same as the chance of selling another company in investment for 2 billion. Mm -hmm. Right, where when the initial valuation is lower, and if but most founders we, we meet, you know, we don't see any chance of any billions. Most of the time, when someone refers a great founder, you know, we look at it and we consider it and we kind of imagine that if they're really successful, maybe they'll get 50 million, right? Because the company is just you know, we don't we just don't see that person leading something that amazing, and we don't you know, we pass, right? And of course, sometimes we do invest and we think it's going to be huge. And a few months later, we realize, you know what, it's probably at best going to be 50 million and it's okay. Like we might still make some money, right? But we, you know, we, we aren't always right, of course. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, you have to be diversified. You have to have a lot of investments, right? Uh, but you, you get better as you do it. I've been doing it for 20 years, right? And I think I made some terrible angel investments you know, in my early days, right? Uh, and we probably make some mistakes today, but every time we learn, right? We look, we, we reconsider, you know, when we see things happening with companies, we, mm -hmm. we remember our investment process, our decision-making when we first made the check. And sometimes we sort of see what we did wrong, where we made a mistake. Other times, you know, the company might fail, but we might not feel that we made a mistake. We might have made a choice again because the company fails for other factors that can't be predicted, right? Or the company might even succeed and you still think it was like a bad investment. So you have to sort of constantly mm -hmm be open to being wrong, you know, analyze your results and improve yourself all the time. And you also have to improve, you know, your entire network. Like there's like literally hundreds and hundreds of people who introduce founders to me personally, right? And so I'm always kind of like gently educating them all uh, in, in what I'm looking for. Because I don't really want to get a bunch of decks and have to like read decks and guess based on the deck who to take a meeting with and spend half my day reading decks. I'd rather meet the founders, right? And it means that the people who introduce like have to be very, very selective. They have to really, you know, introduce the founders I'm likely to actually like. So you kind of, you know, you explain to people what you're looking for. You tell them that, you know, you want signal. You don't want to see five things from someone who is like running an accelerator. You know, you don't want some Y Combinator founder to, to give you his, you know, 20 best companies from this year's 200 company demo day. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't really you know, I want to see, you know, I want the same founder to show me, you know, one company every three years and to love it and to like personally invest in it and to like quit his job and join it. Like that's, that's the one I want, right? A very, very strong signal. That's what other VCs want as well, of course. That's, I think that's generally common to venture investors. So you would say, okay, the, the, you're touching also interesting topic in terms of like the, the introductions, because, you, know, you know, being in this field, like I'm sure like you, know, you and me, we have a lot of people who are like constantly, you know, like sending something, oh, take a look, right? 
And obviously one of the first criteria probably is like, did you invest yourself, right? If the answer is no, well, the question is like, why not? Like if you think it's such a great company, right? So I guess, I guess one of the first check marks should be like, you know, okay, so yeah, the person should invest like himself or herself, number one. So number two, obviously should be uh, what I like more of a exponential growth, you know, like potential, right? You know, something like that's not just like your typical two, three X that a lot of VCs are like happy and they're like, oh, wow, this is like, this is okay. This, this goes to this bucket in my portfolio and this is fine, right? So, uh, so it should be probably more like five, 10 X potential or something like that, right? And except no, for us, it's like, it's, it's literally like, 50 x as an absolute minimum that we are expecting like we just don't do any 5 10 x that's not interesting to us well let me ask you okay so this is where i'm trying to get like wh when you're saying 50 x because like the exponential growth companies with 50 x potential they also have proportional risk so how do you evaluate like those opportunities like, look I, I mean my first my first startup was the mit black team and my first fund as well you know and we delivered like 50 year plus returns to investors well, on legal gambling, you know, in the early 90s. Like, risk does not threaten me, you know? Uh, we just want to model it, understand it, and uh, make sure that we are sufficiently diversified, that we have a high expectation of large positive returns. Um, so we would much, much rather invest in a company that's 50 or 60 or even 80% likely to absolutely fail, but has a real chance of, of uh, landing with, like, let's say, $100 billion. Like, very, very rarely do we get to see companies that have a chance to become a hundred billion dollar outcome. Like that's just rare and hard to find. And when I see one of them, it can be incredibly risky and still gonna want to do a deal. But I don't see those very often, you know? Every once in a while I do, you know, I think like, you know, the last investment I just made, you know, I believe is one of those, right? And in fact, it was like a 20 million pre-money, pre-product kind of thing, but the team was incredible. I can't talk about that one just yet, unfortunately. They haven't, they're about to announce the round and once they do, I can talk about it. Uh, you know, like incredible team, every large VC in the world is going to want to be in this round, right? They only took the people they really wanted. And, you know, one of the founders is actually an investor in, in us in one way, right? So in this case, you know, was, that was a source of the intro um, because they, they had previously built a multi-billion dollar successful company, these guys, right? Um, and so they're going after a very large space, right? So, um, yeah, you know, if you're a VC fund that, that, that wants to have like a 5X kind of outcome, that you got to spend like months doing diligence and lowering the risk. You got to worry about risk reduction. You got to take the board seat and watch it over like a hawk. And like, you know, as soon as the, the CEO does something wrong, you got to think about maybe replacing a CEO. And I don't do any of that stuff. You know, if I, I mean, I'm on a couple of boards. So I try to avoid board seats. I try to help in other ways. Uh, I, I try to avoid, you know, investing in founders who I would have to babysit. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't really scale. Uh, you know, I want to invest in people who are much better than I am at building companies. Right. But that, 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 that's also, uh, I would say, limits your choice to a certain degree of people who already have previous success, as you mentioned, right? Because imagine there is like a very talented, like graduate, like alumni of a uh, university, I don't know, maybe he's talented in artificial intelligence. So just that's his first company. He didn't have like previous, you know, experience and previous results. But the product is looks amazing and there is 50x potential so how would you deal with that because he would need a lot of babysitting in the beginning well we're not going to invest that's how we're going to do it. we're not going to invest in a guy that is a talented ai engineer you know in a, in a big potential market that doesn't have any clue about how to build a company we're going to invest in a team you know we're going to invest in a ceo that can bring that guy together and bring you know this brilliant marketing girl you know and, and bring together like another another guy in Armenia or something who can help them like actually like hire all the API developers, like, you know, bring together a team. And, and yeah, we might come in at the early stage and maybe the CEO hasn't built a business before, right? Maybe the CEO was a product manager who understands the market or a salesperson, right? Um, maybe the CEO is the engineer who really has business savvy. Um, but it's a question of team, right? It's not a single person. Yeah. And, um, yeah. You know, it's true, like some of our companies do need a little more help than others. We do invest, you know, some, some, sometimes we end up with a 10% stake, like we're not always, you know, with a, with a 4 or 5% stake, uh, right? Uh, there's a range, right? Uh, and, but we, and we even do some pre-seed, you know, we do some, some half size checks into in, in an even earlier stage, kind of taking, taking a flyer. To see when, when maybe the entire, there's always a team, there's always a, like two or three person team 
hundred percent of the winner. You invest in a team. Like the, 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 the first criteria, or like, you know, if you have, let's say, researchers, great, and not only always like a combination, like let's say one interpreter who has a good history, one, let's say, scientist like, who has patents and have exceptional results in scientific world, like, and their experience. So, but like in the pre-seed stage, it's hard to evaluate like the business model, right? So you probably invest in people mostly. You invest in people. You always invest in people. Even when when you invest in a Series A and there is a working business model, you better not pay too much attention to the working business model. You got to invest in a team. Like it's a mistake, right? Because actually, uh, you know, a business doing a couple of million in a Series A doesn't really have any certainty based on the business model. You know what I mean? It could just go up and right down. Like you're still investing mostly. You look at everything, obviously, but it's mostly the team. The team is the most important factor all the way until a B or a C round. So let, let's let's. I, this is also particularly interesting because right now we're in COVID. You you don't have the the luxury of actually meeting sometimes people, right? You know, like and now we're having like through this <laughs> this interview is through Zoom, right? And even though like Boston, New York is what like five hour drive, right? <laughs> But uh, the question is, right now, how would you actually do diligence to those people, right? You know, a person is in San Francisco or in Texas, right? Uh, and, and imagine, like, people who are, like, more introverted. They're not on social media. They're, like, you know, not so popular. Like, but they're doing, like, a lot of work, actual work. So how would you, how would you evaluate the, the people and founders right now? Well, obviously, they have Zoom calls, but... I'll tell you the truth. Uh, we've been very, very active since COVID. We've had our best six months ever. We've been made amazing new investments. We've done some uh, SPVs, so RLPs into like very large up rounds, follow on rounds, you know. Um, but what we haven't done is we haven't invested in people that we didn't spend a lot of face to face time with, you know, like. Um, so you see, it matters. Uh, usually, yeah, usually, you know, in the last six months, most of our new investors were people who we met previously, you know, who, for whatever reason, we didn't previously invest with. So maybe they, they pivoted a little bit or they got more traction or whatnot, or, uh, you know, we just knew them from their previous company or something. And so we, we did do a Zoom call, but we already knew them. There's a couple of exceptions. Oh, very few. I think there's like, I can only think of one exception. One, we did like, and we've done a bunch of A's recently. We've done these like much, much larger rounds where we get 1% of the company, you know, that are like incredibly fast growing companies. And we're very lucky to sort of, it's really companies that should be doing Bs that we got into the A price because of the immigrant story. And most of those, we just knew the CEOs from before, right? Like they were maybe mentors in my tax test program or, or we knew them through other investors or my West Coast partner like used to work with people from the company. His last company, he built a really big company uh, called Inca Free, this VPN company, you know, he has whatever, hundreds of millions of customers, literally. Um, and so knows a lot of people there. Uh, so yeah, it was people, the one exception was, was, uh, where we just, uh, the, the, the founder had a mega unicorn previously. He's like a famous founder. Again, I wish I could tell you exactly who it is. It's, they're going to announce the round very soon. It's, this is our second one that we did very, very recently. Um, and in that case, uh, you know, there were the, we just relied on lead. We, we had a great zoom call with, with both you know, two key co-founders, the, the super famous one who used to be a CTO of, let's say, like a, you know, one of the top, whatever, top 50 companies that you've heard of, right? Mm -hmm. He's the founder CEO of that and, uh, and is now starting the startup as a CEO and then the other guy is a product manager. And so, yeah, we just, we met him on just on the Zoom call, but uh, there, there were like three other billion dollar plus funds, each just doing 500K because that's all these guys needed. And then they had already launched and they were already getting success and they just expanded that, that sort of notes round and let us in for the same terms, you know, 500K from us as well. So it's just us and three gigantic organizations, right? And no one else. And they don't need any money. They didn't need our money. Like, again, it was like the guy, we were talking to the guy about investing in our fund too. And, and we found out he's doing it and we just ended up investing ourselves. Uh, and, you know, then in general, when you follow, uh, a lot of the VCs and you could get access like to their internal notes on the diligence, you do much, much less work. And then sometimes, sometimes maybe you could even just do a call, but 90% of the time for us, it's, it's face to face time with the CEO that's, that can't really be replaced. And so, uh, so far we haven't slowed down because there's been enough relationships, you know, if, if COVID lasts like another two years or something, yeah, that would get tough and we'd have to probably do stuff just on zoom. But I don't believe that's the case at all. I think we got another few months left, and, and we're gonna do more face-to-face -face stuff. So, given now, I, I am taking some face-to-face -face meetings with founders today, 
like I'm just doing walking meetings around my neighborhood, you know, and, or I've gone to New York once or twice, like even, even during COVID you can do it. Got it. So realistically, like even, even the fact that it's coming from a trusted network, like probably like the best course of action would be for, for the founders would be to fly to Boston and meet you once in person, keep the social distancing, right? And, <laughs> but still like, you know, to, to meet face to face, right? I mean, yeah, at some point, you know, we're going to want that. Sure. If we, I mean, we're going to do a call first, right? Like we certainly wouldn't ask anyone to fly to Boston uh, talk at the, you know, we've had, right? we've had people show up like at the office without an enforcement. <laughs> you know? That's pretty awkward, right? Like don't do that, please. <laughs> no, no, we're not. We're talking about like, adequate, you know, like sequence. Yeah, yeah. No, people have noticed. It's pretty, it's pretty funny. And sometimes, like, I actually, you know, I kind of like it, right? Because it shows like balls. It shows like amazing energy, right? But at the end of the day, no, like it's not. You know, to get a if you can't get a warm intro, you know, you got you got bigger issue, right? Uh, than that. Um, but yeah, we're gonna probably want to get some face time in before we invest. We're very unlikely. You know, we're not gonna invest in a company based in some other part of the world, or even some other part of America, like something based in Chicago, like, uh, you know, or it could be great, but the, we, we're going to, we're going to absolutely, you know, we know some great funds in Chicago, like one of the, the, what we consider the best funds that are based there are going to have to lead that round and share their diligence book with us for us to even consider it. Like we're not going to go and lead a round in, in Boulder, Colorado or Austin, Texas, you know, or Philadelphia or Chicago or whatever. If the local, if, there's only two or three funds in each of those cities, right? Like if they're not, involved like we're not gonna come do it and we certainly b before we had a partner on the west coast we never would have like tried to you know invest in the company based on the west coast out of boston like that's you know that's just you know that's a lot of that's a lot of great vcs who passed on that business you know um so so, so at the moment you know like you're still like it, it, now where you have more like possibility and more flexibility to invest in companies and to lead the round for to co-invest, like, you know, like, even though they're in different parts of the United States. Like, you're not going to lead, potentially, but you can co-invest, right? Yeah, I mean, we were always open to co-investing with the right lead. We'd still meet the founder once. We'd go, we'd just, you know, hop on a plane before COVID, right? And, and or they would come here, I'm all, you know, but uh, we, uh, we, we do like to lead on occasion. Uh, and, it, and our second fund, we're going to, because our check size will be 1 million and the rounds tend to be 2 or 3, you know, it'll be much easier for us to lead. You know, realistically, we, we only could lead uh, it, it with a 500k check, you know, with, when, when the other investors knew us and respected us, right? Like, it's difficult to do. Like, they, people don't usually want to follow with a million dollar check, a lead VC that's putting in half a million. But we did do that three or four or five times successfully in the first fund, and it'll be much easier for us in the second. But again, those companies will generally be based in New York, Boston, Montreal, Toronto, or San Francisco, LA. Kind of. those, are, those are the spots where we're going to, have enough face-to-face -face meetings to get the comfort to our own diligence to lead the round ourselves and, and bring, put the round together as the first investor. It's going to be in those locations. Yeah. Until, we are, you know, until later when we add more partners elsewhere. No, I see. I think it's still smart. You have your own strategy and your thesis. And, and uh, So really quick question uh, in terms of, like, does it, you're industry agnostic, right? So right now you just invest in exponential ideas, right? Or you still, there's a particular focus at the moment. So as a fund, we are completely agnostic. As an individual partner in a fund, I have my areas of interest. My partners each have their areas of interest. So collectively, we have a pretty long list of areas that we like, you know, and they are open, but uh, we are much, much more likely each of us to take a meeting when it's an area that we find interesting. And it changes over time as well. Like uh, for for. A good year last year i was looking at outer space i was like i love companies doing private space work and i made three investments and actually all three of them have done good up rounds like we're all doing really well um i can talk about those if you're interested right yeah but that's not an area of interest to me for fun too necessarily right like it maybe it's it's very rare like these are and you these are companies that are fairly capital efficient which is unusual in the space universe right most companies are incredibly capital intensive right and so you know, there's reasons why those, but they're all very different. They're not in the same part of space. Uh, you know, one is telecommunications, one is, one is uh, propulsion, uh, like from nano small satellites into orbital transfer. And then the other one is like l launching rockets from balloons. Uh, <laughs> balloons, they call them. Those are the three. Um, uh, so, you know, there was an area that I, I sort of, uh, you know, I stumbled onto one of them and then I ended up meeting the others through that one, right? Um, uh, but, uh, 
I, I think a longer term area of interest is machine learning for me because it's just something I had some, some technical understanding of at some point in my life and still you know, know enough to be dangerous, at least to tell, to tell a CTO you know, apart one from another a little bit, right? Uh, certainly don't know nearly as much as the founders that I'm backing, right? But I know enough. Uh, my partner, Alex, uh, loves FinTech and PropTech and some, some productivity stuff. You know, each, each of the partners does that. I think we, we look at a lot of AR and VR, though we haven't written a lot of checks, but we're looking very active right now in AR, looking at stuff. Um, and then some, some SaaS enterprise stuff as well with another partner. So it varies by person uh, and, and over time because, uh, you know, there's timing cycles to these things too. You don't always want to go against the current. Sometimes, sometimes things get uh, too, too crowded, you know. There's copycat startups, there's areas that were great a couple of years ago that you wouldn't want to touch now, you know. Like we did invest in the company that we do have like an outsized ownership in. We, we invested a larger amount and at a lower valuation in March, in early March, uh, in a company that went to basically doing COVID testing. And, you know, by, by June, you know, I saw like a hundred business plans for companies that were pivoting to COVID related stuff. And like, you know, we don't have an open number, of course, right? Like, cause it's, it's too late, right? Yeah, this leap of faith, I, you know, it's, there's a lot of companies that are saying that we have the cure or we have the opportunity to basically distribute like, you know, logistically like the... Yeah, no, I'm not even talking about like cure. I'm just saying like, like people who, I don't know, they were doing machine vision before and then for like face recognition. And now they're like, we'll do temperature checks for your employees as they walk in because that's, that's what you need, right? And I was like, you know, everyone is doing it, you know, so how many of them do you really need, right? Because yeah. this thing will last. The, the COVID, COVID is going to end, right? It's not forever. Nothing is forever. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, you know, uh, this too shall pass, as uh, one of our, like, forefathers mentioned, right? So, and everything is like that. So, so the, talking about your portfolio, maybe you can provide, like, one example that would be, I would say not iconic, but like some kind of like a canonical example, some good example that when you identify the company really early, like pre-seed stage, and they did the right moves to basically draw your attention, you've invested and now you're like strategically like adding up the investment seeds, series A, series B, and you know, and later. Yeah, so we don't do a lot of follow-on. You know, we, we, we reserve only a little bit of our capital for follow-on. And so we do, we, you know, when we invest later, it's like a symbolic amount. Sometimes it's like we had 100K or something, but we always run STVs for our LP. So uh, when, not, not always, I shouldn't say, sometimes, you know, sometimes we don't believe the valuation is right. But when we like the deal, when we like the company, uh, then we, uh, maybe our pro rata is like, I don't know, a million or two million or whatever into that larger round. We uh, allow our LPs to directly invest via a vehicle. Um, and so... You know, companies that, and they understand, like we, we started investing three years ago. We, we finished raising our first fund two years ago. With, that's when we got it to 28 million. And so, you know, the last, it takes, it does take some time for these companies to go <laughs> through the rounds, right? Uh, but there are some already that have done multiple rounds, certainly. You know, one that comes to mind is uh, Chipper Cash, where we came in at the seed, you know, at a, at a reasonably low price. Uh, you know, we weren't the only fund. There was, there was another fund leading the deal, but we were like, pretty much like the same similar size you know check like nobody was over a million it was like a small round uh under two million i think was they seed and you know they, they've raised significant uh, amounts since then in multiple you know much higher valuation rounds um uh there's uh i don't know a company called momentous old brex was our, our it's not an example we didn't come in quite as early as we should have just because of the timing of our fund we got in a little late but still you know they they very quickly went from where from that level uh, like the AMP level to a to unicorn valuation. And then the last round was at a two and a half billion dollar price. You know, and this is, this is in a one way portfolio already. So sometimes it happens quite quickly. Um, other times, you know, it takes a little longer. We have other companies that we know are doing incredibly well. They have like five or 10 X revenue growth, but they haven't done the next round at all yet. Like they, they invested, let's say six months ago. And, you know, we know it's worth a couple of times more, but obviously that's not, you know, that's reflected in our numbers because they have to raise another round. Um, and, you know, sometimes there's others that have raised the big up round that maybe are not doing quite as well. So it does, you know, each situation is different. Um, and, you know, I think people in general pay probably a little too much attention to like the round sizes and so forth. Like, mm -hmm. you know, raising a large round, you know, it's a good sign, of course, and it does give you a lot more ammunition, but it's not in and of itself a determination of success, right? Yeah, so, so sometimes I do agree with you, it's exuberant and they, people are over, 
estimating like, you know, the amount of capital they actually require. And, and then it becomes a question what's going to happen next, right? And okay, so you have a lot of, you're sitting in a lot of cash, which you're not using and you have this overvalued, uh, so valuation is higher than it's supposed to be and it, it can impact the further rounds, right? right. Yeah, we would prefer a company that, that you know, raises a seed and then just gets great revenue growth and doesn't really you know, do another round for like seven or eight or 10 years and then, then sells for several billion. Obviously, we'll have a lot more ownership and it's a better story. Mm -hmm. Even not as loud a story. Um, but you know, most companies do raise multiple rounds, of course. Usually, yeah. the, the opportunity to build something very large usually does require multiple rounds of capital. And so, you know, we do have a whole bunch of portfolio companies that have done that, and we, we often participate with STVs. No, and, and sometimes, as I understand, it's not, you people are raising money not only because they actually need capital, it's also because they need strategic partners, some other, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. VCs who so, open up some doors. And, and sometimes the, the, large, the VCs of the large, you know, billion-dollar funds can, can be extraordinarily helpful because they exactly. usually it's, often it's because of their portfolio founders, uh, who have been successful, right? Like if you, uh, if you're Mark and Reason who invested, you know, in Facebook early, right? Like, and you can get Mark Zuckerberg to, to like talk to a founder or the one time they really need to talk to Facebook, you know, that means something, right? That's, that's why, you know, you're going to have that, that firm, you know, back Oculus and then later sell Oculus to Facebook for, for instance, right? Um, so VCs at all stages could sometimes add a lot of value. And there's also a lot of useless ones who can add no value, but they don't tend to do as well, right? The VCs that add the most value to founders tend to eventually deliver the best returns to their LP, right? Yeah, so how would you help founders also to identify, let's say you are the leading investor, right? And there are two other like funds that are potentially investing. Like, do you actually have this conversation with the founder saying like, well, these guys are great and this probably oh, like will not a lot of add value to your startup? Oh yeah, of course we do. Of course, we do. I mean, I, I would say my deepest knowledge of that universe is in the local area where I've been for a long time personally, around the Boston area. Uh, I mean, I know VCs in, in the West Coast of New York as well, but I, I would, you know, I know the ones here very well because I used to run this accelerator, and our job was to like know every VC and understand who who is a good match for whom. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's an area where we generally can help founders since we have more experience with other investors than they do. Right? We've seen many deals; they've only seen a few deals. No, I'm sure it's that's that's another like tremendous I would say advantage of working with experience, you know, VCs as opposed to people who are not, you know, like they're just entering. They provide only money, right? So, like, let's let's talk a little bit about your LP. So I'm sure you you you, you can you're happy to talk about like some of the exits, you know, like you have, like you know. But I'm also curious, what are the incentives for people to become a limited partner, so to speak, an in, investor, like, and be part of. Uh, uh, of uh, one-way ventures, and what are the conditions? Well, I mean, we have standard terms for investors, right? like, like other VC funds. It's, there's nothing unusual there. There's a What's the minimum check? Uh, the minimum check for us is 500k commitment, typically for folks who can add some value. Right? We do. We do try to pick people who, who have networks. You know, with like our last few LPs that are jumping into the fund too. Some of them are engineers at Google. Some of them, you know, just know a lot of like technical folks. Uh, because you know that's what we wanted more more of. Uh, but previously we've had um, a lot of founders. Uh, you know, people. Uh, so we had a lot of LPs. Our minimum check was smaller in Fund One. We had 80, 80 something LPs in Fund One, and you know, most of them are reinvesting in Fund Two. So we'll have even more in Fund Two. Um, we might actually hit our limit. There's like nine. You're allowed to take like 99 uh, qualified investor or whatever. So we'll be a little limited by that. So I mean, we do have to raise. We had to raise the minimum a little bit, and we are trying to get million dollar commitments and stuff too from people. Um, but we love having this big group, right? Because they are part of our community there. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do they invest? Well, they, they, they like the story, they get it, they understand why we invest in immigrant founders. They like the idea that like people, the best people should be able to build a business wherever the hell they want to and shouldn't worry about visas and nonsense like that. But fundamentally, you know, they, they want to make higher returns. And this is, this is a long-term illiquid investment. And so you expect a premium over what you can get from the market, right? Like we are, we are modeling, you know, three or four X kind of, you know, outcomes as a base case. And we, we, we make sure we have a shot at something much more on the whole fund, you know, in 10 or 12 years, right? And so um, people invest because they, they want to get those returns. They want to make money. But they also, some of them do it because they're also angels and they like to do direct, but they recognize that we have better deal flow and, 
they want uh, access to our SPVs, our follow-on rounds, or they just want to see how we run things, or they want to be a part of the group too. Like, you know, before COVID, we would have an actual like LP meeting parties, basically. We would go to dinner and people would stay out late and just hang out. You know, we're a like-minded community of strong, you know, people ourselves. Like, mm-hmm. like I said, the majority of our LPs are founders who've had exits, who've sold companies themselves. And a lot of them are immigrants. Some of them aren't, you know, some of them just have observed that they like immigrant founders um, and they themselves aren't immigrants. You know, most of them are based uh, in the U.S., but we do have some people from Eastern Europe and from even Japan, one guy, you know, we have, we have a pretty diversified group of people. It's pretty cool. Oh, that's amazing. That's a nightmare. But, but I would say the core of your investors and your partners are, they're, they're located in Boston area, right? Uh, no, I wouldn't. The majority probably are in Boston. I mean, probably there are more from Boston than from any one other place, right? But it's not a majority. Like, they distribute. We have some, a bunch in the West Coast, uh, you know, in San Francisco area, Seattle. We have a lot of LPs in New York. You know, we have a couple in, in Canada as well. Like, our, where we had venture partners, we had two venture partners. One of them became a, a full fund partner with Fund2 now. Right? He was started as a venture partner. Mm-hmm. And the guy in Canada is still a venture partner, meaning that he's like half-time, basically. He still runs the company and he does investing in that area for us. And, and, and you know, they're both themselves significant LPs. Like, that's our model. You know, a venture partner has to write a pretty big, you know, bigger than a minimum check, let's just say, to be an LP, you know, as an LP in the fund first. Um, and, yeah, we have... We have uh, Actually, and a bunch of folks uh, in Kiev, Ukraine, just because I had a network there. I, I used to have a company that I took public that was based there uh, a long time ago. Um, as an early you know, angel investment, but whatever, I was pretty involved with it. Uh, and uh, yeah, other parts in Europe here and there, um, all sorts of folks. So how many, if I may ask you, like you did over 200 angel investments, which is like, Crazy number to me. <laughs> like, so how many of uh, how many exits did you did you have? No, a bunch of exits. I mean, I, I don't remember how many. Uh, Roughly, I'm just curious. Like, you know, you can say percentage wise. <laughs> uh, dozens, you know, dozens. Less than half of the. I mean, uh, so of the angel portfolio. Uh, and I mean, I, I I should break it down. It's like 200. I would be the full number between angels and what I did the textures ended one way right there was maybe 120 like pure angel checks for me 130 something like that um, I, I would say over half of those have, have failed at this point like I had a very high failure rate I would say the failure rate's a little lower now right but like as I was learning I was doing this for 20 years right I had a high failure rate uh, but I've done well like I've, I, my, my overall like personal angel return is 35% a year in actual cash return right like all, on all the money overall like on average and That's my great. return at Techstars, at Techstars had LPs, and those funds are actually a little above that level. Like, so uh, they are on paper, you know, like one of them is, is two or three X, and another is uh, like the, the best one, there's four sub funds. My best, my last Techstars fund is actually already like six times. Like my 2017 Techstars program that I ran is up to six X already as a whole, you know, all 12 companies in aggregate. So only like three or four of those have failed, and you know, most of them have raised multiple up rounds. Like there's some star companies in that class. Um, so yeah, but in the angel portfolio, the failure rate's pretty high, uh, it's well over 50%, right? And then of the exits, you know, most exits are not really exactly successes. Like, you know, there's exits for, you know, a little less than what I got back. And there's exits where you get like one and a half X back, or, you know, there's a bunch of those. And then there's the, you know, as far as the exits that drive my returns, my, the 35%, right, it was three. You know, we had th- I had three multi-million dollar kind of outcomes on original 50K checks. Only three, you know. That's, and that's kind of a statistic. About it too, you know, so. <laughs> so that's so I, I, I'm sure this is a statistic that are very typical in your world, right? Because I, I the, the more I speak with VCs and a lot of my friends, you know, they tell me that, if out of 10 companies, eight are failing, that's fine. That's, that's, compu- that's actually part of our model, right? You know, so, uh, so I, I guess yours, your, if, if you have like, let's say 50%, like meaning like five companies only fail, that's already great. And out of those five companies, if one or two actually becoming more like exponential, uh, so that's, that's how would you probably compute the entire model? Well, the, the thing is like, there's actually almost no correlation. It doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter whether uh, two fail or five fail or eight fail. Like that impact on your total return. Like let's say you're aiming for four x, you know, in in twelve years, right? Um, 
you know, it, all those failures will, will not make a difference. It'll be like 3.8 or 3.9x, right? Like, it won't matter. Like, whether you have two failures or 20% or 80% failure rate simply doesn't impact your return. The only thing that matters is how big is the biggest success, right? Mm-hmm. Is the, if your biggest success is 100x, it's going to be a 3x outcome. If your biggest success is 1,000x, it's going to be a 10x outcome, right? Like, the, the overall outcome is driven by the size of the success. And so when you look at uh, the startups to invest in, like, you got to make sure that you don't invest, you don't use up all your slots, you don't invest in too many small potential outcomes. You have to take multiple shots. It's so hard to find the next Google, right? You know, it's so incredibly hard that you want every check you write to have a possibility of being that. Yeah, I, I, I cannot even imagine, like, how hard, because even if you have great networks, like, there's so, like, it's still, like, a limited amount of, like, all the project that actually match all the criteria, right? And like it's, a, it's, 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 and, and there cannot be a lot of them. Like it just, again, statistically, it doesn't work like that, right? So you have to be very, very smart and like, how, like if you're hiring or incentivizing like outsource scouts or people who are like happy to share with you. Because again, there comes a lot of, um, uh, I would say, things that people don't talk about, right? There's a competition inside the VC world. Like who would you, if, imagine you identify as a person, as an introductory, uh, a great startup. Now you have your friend, like your personal and good friend who's a VC founder. And of course you have better chances to introduce this project first to him, right? Rather than go to some other people, right? Even though you know that strategically sometimes this particular fund might be better for the project, right? But there is also internal currents, I would say, like, you know, the incentives of the people who are introducing projects, they're also very, right? So that's another point why sometimes, you know, founders, they, they criticize, you know, VCs that they don't give them money or they don't have access to the capital, right? And vice versa, VCs criticize uh, sometimes <laughs> saying like, well, we didn't have access to the projects. And, you know, the perfect match is, is, is a matter of experience, as you mentioned, right? So, uh, my, my, my question to you also, like, you know, how would you, like, um, how would you suggest to an LP who's considering, let's say, investment and VC fund like yours, right? How would you uh, suggest, uh, and have, like, imagine we have multiple options, right? Five to ten different funds. One of them is can be top tier, like Anderson and Horvitz and uh, like Sequoia and others, like then there are smaller ones and, and but again with better returns and we know statistically that smaller funds actually most of the time outperform the bigger one like and uh, like especially those are in serious seed stage and serious a stage so how well, do you also get to see more that pretty well right like consistently year after year uh, right like they, they deliver pretty good returns to the lps uh most funds when they get a little larger their returns drop right and then there's a few uh, super kind of star funds that year after year deliver great returns. So there's not a lot of them. I would say there's also very few LPs who have access to those funds. Like they never, you know, the, the, the funds that consistently do well over the long term, um, they pretty much, you know, they, they have uh, very high minimums, like in, in the tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And they work with the same LPs that are typically like university endowments and people like that, uh, sometimes state pension funds, you know, for decades. So you can't exactly just, you know, walk up to them and say, hey, you know, I want to invest. Unless, unless like, they do something really crazy, like Sequoia starts to raise a $100 billion fund, you know, to compete with SoftBank. And, it, and then, yeah, then any family office can invest. But, like, that's not the Sequoia fund you want to invest in, right? Like, that's an unproven model. Like, it, and, you know, it's, it's kind of different people as well. Um, so I, I would say... Uh, as LPs, you know, you want, you want to get access to, to a fund that's small enough, right, that, that it's easier to get the large results because the check size is smaller. Uh, it's not as competitive, but, but then you ha- it's a question of who is running it. You've got to find people you believe in and, you know, having a focus that that's right. Like, I, you know, um, I think for us, like, if we wouldn't have this immigrant focus, we wouldn't be one of the ventures. So, you know, it wouldn't be the same. Our returns wouldn't be the same. So, uh, but ultimately, of course, it's about the people there as well, right? You want to invest in, in a VC, you know, partner who you really believe in because uh, most of them are not that great. Like, honestly, like it's one of these industries where, uh, you know, you can't just be, you can't be like a little better than average and do okay, right? Like the, the average results are not that great. They're not really any better than like investing in, you know, in, 
in in an S&P 500 index fund, right? Like with a lot more liquidity. Uh, but the top 20% of the VCs do like phenomenally well. So you 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 know you shouldn't be investing in a fund if you don't think that it's going to be like a top 10 or 20% of the seed managers. So what would be the major due diligence like points that you would offer any limited partner to evaluate? Like besides obviously the founder is number one, the returns, that that's obvious. Maybe some other parameters that right now the person who just purely doesn't have experience in, in like approaching the VC funds and investing in them does not know. What would be other parameters that you would suggest to look at? I mean, we, we open up everything to LPs, like we have data room, we show them our stuff. It's, it's portfolio, track record, reputation, you know, what you talk to the founders who, who the VC has backed, right? Like ideally, uh, that, that, that's pretty telling. You can talk to other investors. You can look at the list of like other people who have invested in this fund and talk to them. You know, the, like when someone is raising a second fund, obviously there's a bunch of people who invest in a third fund. You can tell them, you know, you can look at the results, but you can also just ask them if they're happy with the investment. You can ask them if they're reinvesting in the fund too. You know, like most of our one of the LPs are investing in fund too. Like we didn't have to, we're not really doing a lot of fundraising, right? Like the second fund is pretty easy to raise. It's like the same people just want in again and a few more jump in and it's done, right? I mean, we've been at it for a couple of weeks, we already started the closing process and it's going to be large. Like we will, well, anyway, it's, it's not a problem, let's just say. Um, so uh, diligence, you know, I think if you're not experienced in this world, you got to, uh, the problem is like having access, right? You might just, the best VCs don't really need your money, right? Like, so it's hard to, um, just like when you're looking directly, you know, I think if you're lucky enough to have access to someone who, who seems to be a really strong investor with a really strong track record, you kind of want to jump in. There's not a lot of work you have to do. And if you're in a lucky position to have access to like three, three funds like that, you know, maybe you invest in all of them, I don't know. Uh, or you could figure out which one is the strongest of the three. But like, you know, it's not that likely that you, you have that access, right? Like you, you might, I mean, there's all these funds that are like, that have to advertise for investors that it's just like, you know, but they, they never have a strong track record. They never have any, any actual evidence that they're going to succeed, right? right? Like anyone who has trouble raising money, just like well, the same thing with the, with the companies, right? When you're going direct to like most, if you don't have to fight to get in, if you don't have to, argue with the founder about like how much value you can add as an investor. If the founder is begging for your money, it's probably not the best investment opportunity in the world, right? right. So that's, that's an interesting point. So you're basically saying that all the good funds will probably not actually need your money, right? You know, so you will have to fight to get in, like, you know, it's kind of exclusive. Well, I mean, I would say if they're first time funds and they're first or second funds that the large institutions don't tend to invest in, they're much more likely to accept money from individuals that have smaller minimums. Um, so I wouldn't say they totally don't need your money, but they, they spend some effort still in fundraising, but not as much. Like the funds that have spent years raising a fund, uh, they are not probably going to be the best ones. Right? Of course. And given the fact that like it's an eight to 10 year game, you know, like, so it's, it's definitely like a long shot, you know, like, and at least, yeah. I mean, the standard fund length of 10 years. So, uh, and it's extended usually the, the standard terms allow allow the LP advisory to extend by two additional one year terms. So it, it ends up being a 12 year instrument. So yeah, it's a very long time. And like, you know, if you're talking about uh, sort of younger investors who just don't have the track record, it's really hard to say. How well so, by the way, another, this, uh, uh, another question, which I was asked, like, you know, by a young investor who's interested to like allocate some uh, VC funds, he asked me, so what are the partial, uh, is there, do you allow partial exits? Let's say you have a good, like you have a portfolio of great companies, like, and, and you see that in five years, it's already like amazing, right? And you, you can actually exit some of the companies. So do you allow some of the partial exits for some of these? Uh, do I allow my LPs to decide which of my portfolio companies to sell? No, not the portfolio companies. Let's say if an LP, like, you know, been with you, like it's a 10 year fund, right? So. Oh, oh secondary, you... fund secondaries. I mean, yeah, yeah, we have yeah. fund secondaries. Yeah. I mean, it happens sometimes. Like, uh, it's usually when, uh, you know, cause we don't, we don't take the money up front, right? Like if someone invests, you know, a million dollars in our next fund, we're only going to call uh, 125,000 uh, in, you know, in our, we have a schedule, right? Like every January, we call 12%, every July, we call 12.5%. So, you know, it's invested over the years. And let's say, you know, two years into the investment period, we've called half the capital and the person, you know, because of COVID, their other business started failing. Like we had a couple of those, right? And they just like, they don't want to keep making capital calls. 
So yeah, we facilitated like a partial private transaction where like half of the interest as an LP in the fund, they sell to someone else. We always have a line of people who like, who, you know, once you stop fundraising, people of course want to keep, you know, you keep meeting people who want to invest and the next fund is in three years. So we have like a waiting list in between. We have a waiting list of people who, who want to invest. So it's very easy to, you know, for, to, but you can't, that's not a guarantee. Of course, you can't rely on that, right? On that liquidity. Like anything else, like I like stock in a private company, you know, you can always sell your shares in a private transaction if you can find a buyer. Uh, sometimes, you know, you get a better price or worse price, like it just depends. Um, so, but that's not, you know, it's rare. So far, it's only been a couple of people, right, who've done that. Um, but uh, we also sometimes, uh, to answer the question I thought you were asking, we as a fund occasionally sell our positions in the companies we invest in as well. Yeah, like, we have to wait for the company to exit. If we, every time the company does a big round, we actually always think about selling. We are, because it's just a discipline. Like you don't think about buy. Like every transaction, you have to evaluate if the price is right. So you have to think of it as a buyer and a seller. And in a sense, like if if you have an opportunity to sell and you don't sell, then you're actually buying at that price, right? It's the same. Not selling is buying, right? And so if you invested in the company at a ten million dollar valuation and they're doing around at a hundred million dollar valuation, and you know, you, you don't feel comfortable about like doing an SPV, you, you think the price is too high and the company doesn't have the right potential, you can't do 50X from this level, you know, you got to ask yourself, why am, why am I not selling, right? Um, so who do you sell to? Price? I wouldn't buy, I should sell. So, and we don't do it often, like we buy much more than we sell, because uh, usually these companies are just accelerating even further. But, you know, sometimes we decide to exit and then, you know, we find someone to buy our position from the fund and then we have a distribution to our LPs in the middle of the fund period. Like not all the money comes back in 10 years. Sometimes exits happen earlier. Sometimes an exit happens because the whole company sells uh, or goes public. And other times the exit happens because we as a fund just sell our shares to someone else. And who do you sell to typically? It's usually other people who are trying to get into that company. It's people who can't get into their, like their round is full, you know? And so some, we actually sometimes get a premium about, about the price of their round when we sell our shares. Mm -hmm. So other VCs or syndicates, uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, family offices, people who want more allocation. You know, when a company is large and high profile, there's always there's the market for their stock. Like okay? anything that's worth more than a couple billion, uh, you can pretty much, uh, you know, there's brokers sometimes you can employ who, who will match buyers and sellers. You know, there's a secondary market. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's, uh, I have my own opinion about like what's going to happen to the secondary market because right now there's a lot of, to make the digitize actually those shares and make an entire market. Yeah, no, there's some interesting stuff in, in blockchain and whatever. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. stuff happening. And uh, I, I've seen those examples. They're not as liquid as, you know, you, people would expect in the beginning. But again, it's, it takes time, you know, like, uh, but I'm sure that's, that's, the, that's the future. Uh, when everything is going to be more transparent and there will be less intermediaries, you know, like the, um, yeah, so the, the, the access to those deals will be, also still like limited to certain pools of people, right? With, you know, obviously a certain amount of capital and connections. However, it will st still be more, I would say global, right? You know, so you will not have to be like, no, personally, Simon, like, you know, uh, you will, you can be somewhere in Saudi Arabia, UAE or China, and you will still get into deal room and potentially buy something from your- Right, company. right. But that being said, like, you know, uh, some of the top companies, you know, they control their cap table pretty closely, you know, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily allow secondary, you know, there's right of first refusal. They don't necessarily allow secondary transactions. Uh, so unless you're like, you're, you're buying shares in an entity that already holds a preferred stock, you know, it might be pretty challenging. And in particular, like as a VC fund, you know, I say that my LPs have some liquidity, they can exit to someone else. We have to approve those transactions. Like we're not, we're not going to let some random guy we don't know who the hell whose money it is. Like you know, buy out a one-way LP. Like it has to. We we. I know the, my LPs personally very well. Every single one of them, right? Like, I mean, some of them are over calls, right? But these days, you know, you talk on Zoom quite a bit. But it's not like we like to have uh, people who can add some value to our portfolio. We we we, we want to just like a company wants to have good VCs. You know, we want to have LPs who can add value. So. Uh, you know, you, you can't just, uh, like, if you're an LP, you can't sell your shares in, in our fund to a random person. We have to approve that, of course. Well, no, of course. I, I was saying more of a, if you're exiting the company completely, right? And if you were like, let's say you're selling out your positions and... Well, sometimes the company, sometimes the company doesn't want uh, 
us to sell. They, they wanted us as an investor and mm -hmm. they want some random family office. So we usually have to approve, like when we've done that, a couple of times we, we there was one, one specific case where we were exited in a significant position. You know, we, we had to get the company CEO, CFO to sign off on it. Like the person we sold to was a pretty good investor with a good track record. No, I'm sure there's a lot of different modeling and it depends on like case by case situation, right? So, but again, I, I, I'm excited to talk about it. And I feel, I feel like we can talk about an hour or so, but I also want to ask you more like on a personal level, like, you know, so I'm sure like when you just like immigrated with your parents, you know, the journey was, and as you mentioned, like it was, was rough, you know, like, and your father was fortunate to have, you know, this good position, but not everyone is so fortunate. Some people like, for example, I, I arrived in this country with like my parents are still like in Ukraine. I, I don't have like, uh, you know, like some, some close family. I don't have uh, uh, tycoons, you know, like behind, behind my back. So what, uh, what actually helped you? Like, you know, is there probably some event or some potentially a book that actually changed your life? I mean, I mean, for me, like a really formative thing was, was this blackjack team that I was a part of, right? That was mm -hmm. a very unusual way to get started in business. And I learned a lot about modeling, about, you know, the kind of math that actually helps you as an investor about uh, trust as well and evaluating people and trusting them, uh, teamwork, you know, diligence, all these things. I think for me, that was, that was a really formative experience. And there were mentors as well, you know, there were, there were other CEOs I did when I had a software company later in the nineties, I joined a, uh, like a mentor CEO group uh, uh, around Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the, you know, got some value from other peers and from older mentors and then, you know, became a mentor myself and, and so forth. So, you know, there's been a lot of influences over the years and a lot of it, of course, is a school of hard knocks. So you, do, you do stupid stuff and you learn and you do better next time. Right. So, but, but uh, if we were to focus on a one book, like if that actually impacted your life, what would that be? One book? So many books. I, I would say works of fiction have had a bigger impact than, than works of nonfiction. Generally speaking, you learn more about people from novels than, than from, uh, you know, nonfiction books. But if you talk about nonfiction, you know, the, from the recent stuff, I don't know, I, like most people, I, I, I love Harari and Sapiens and, and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and older ones. Yeah. Yeah. Those books, I, I, I don't read a lot. I, I think very long time ago, I read like the, the Five Minute Manager, you know, about delegating and not doing everything yourself. And that, that was impactful. Like sort of little book that made a difference, you know, crossing the chasm at some point. I mean, I don't remember it now, but like, you know, 30 years ago when I read it, uh, you know, that was, that was pretty brilliant inside, you know, focus on one specific niche, jump from niche to niche, don't try to boil the ocean. You know, basic stuff like that certainly influenced me, but I would much more so works of fiction. Well, what, what is your favorite uh, book in the fiction section, I would say? Oh God, I can't be a single book. That's hard. That's hard. Yeah, like you can name a few. I don't know. Uh, uh, I like a book called Freedom by Jonathan Franzen, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, there, I, I, I don't know. I like, I like to read uh, very different things. Science fiction is very important as a VC investor in technology. You got to read sci-fi for sure, right? Because it helps you sort of look into the future a little bit. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because you know, the previous interview was uh, with Tim Draper and you know, Tim is also like an avid reader in, like, in science fiction and he told me, yeah, like uh, right now the world is like, uh, is getting like, you know, it's either like uh, Star Trek or, or Mad Max. So now it's looking like more like a Mad Max, you know, so, so and yeah, like he said like, you know, it's, it's paramount if you're invested in visionaries that you read a lot of like some science fiction to understand that people might have completely different, like, you know, ways of thinking, you know, like their, their critical thinking is not just formed by academics and like, you know, stiff and like, you know, structured models. It's also can be like sporadic. It can be like chaotic, but at the same time, the beauty of the exponential companies comes from crazy ideas, right? You know, so. Absolutely. You got to believe that anything is possible. You got to sort of achieve the impossible. You know, like Elon Musk, when he goes to his engineering team and just like demands things that are completely out of this world. And, and like, unless you can prove mathematically a, a question of physics that it can't be done, he just assumes that it can be done. And like, he'll fire you if you don't do it. You know, like, and, and to some extent it works. You know, he tells an amazing story that's exaggerated or whatever. And then it actually, and then the rockets start landing. I mean, you know, that's, yeah. that's 
that's the CEO <laughs> on the back, right? Like that's that's who we're looking for. I, I'm a big believer. I'm actually a big fan of Elon Musk, and I, and I I'm a big believer that people of this caliber they actually model their reality. They act that they're so confident in their idea and their vision that they almost like bend the barriers of reality and make them like you know like they make this reality come true regardless of any other people what they think absolutely that's exactly what they do that's exactly why and that's why you want to back the person because they make the rest of the reality they tell the story they inspire others and the world changes around them and you know we want to do a little bit of that ourselves one way we are, you know here we are in a world where people are putting up walls and barriers and you know uk is exiting and you know donald trump is building a wall here and you know there's like turkey there's there's very dictatorial you know look at russia i mean there's a lot of uh, nationalism and, and walls going up in the world right and and yet we are saying no the future is open the future has people anywhere being able to do anything build things create things yeah. right? regardless like you should never be limited by your visa, by your passport. Who gives a damn? It's like papers. It's not fair, right? Like, and why, why, why should there be any limits? Why should there be any borders, right? And so that's the reality we kind of live in, and, and you know, we're helping create it to the extent that we can. And I think, I think we'll influence it. I think the degree to which you know we succeed and end up, you know, generating the kind of investor returns that will warrant us having billion-dollar funds and you know offices all over the world, immigrants from anywhere to anywhere. If we pull that off, and we become like one of these brands like Sequoia and Andreessen, uh, I think that's going to impact conversations around the world. That's going to make it more obvious that, in fact, immigrants do create more value than they suck in resources, right? Because, you know, if, if, if one of the biggest VC funds got there by only investing in immigrants, that's a very strong statement that's going to influence mm -hmm. conversations around the world. So that's, that's kind of my long-term goal. Yeah, I'm sure. And, I, and I, for some reason, I believe that with your vision, like this limitless, borderless, and more global, like encompassing and inclusive, I think you will be successful. And I would say that it's not the question of if, I would say it's when you're going to become this, like sizes of Sequoia. So, and this is what I wish you sincerely, I and I, and it's, it's been a great pleasure. And yeah, it feels like we're, on, we're well on our way. So it feels pretty good right now. Yeah, no, I, I, I see you're closing another round and uh, I see uh, I'm closely like looking at your portfolio. I think it's impressive. So uh, listen, I, I wish you well. I think uh, you're ready, <laughs> you know, living your, your life into the highest potential and abundance. So I just wish that you continue with this pace and uh, wish you found, I wish you really find uh, like really good matches like, you know, that for the companies that you also help and that will change the world. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. This has been great. Great question. No, this is great, Simon. Thank you so much, too.